And I hope that uh, as you come in, as strangers come in, they experience the difference between our communion and so many audiences that are observing a performance. It's not a performance. We come here to worship the God we love, studying the Word of God to know the God of the Word. Amen? And where are we this morning? Acts chapter 13. So turn with me there. And uh, if you remember from last week, and if you weren't here, I encourage you to go ahead and look and listen to the tape. All of the messages are online. They're archived. And you can just go to YouTube and type in Community Chapel of Greenville, and they'll come up. So last week, we discussed the history of Israel, right? We went all the way, we started with Adam. And we went all the way from Adam, and we, we ended with David, the king, right? The mercies, the sure mercies of David. What are the sure mercies of David? Yes, that's exactly right, that God would fulfill his promises within the Davidic covenant. That David, one of your descendants, will sit upon your throne for how long? How long? As Brother Graham would say, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> that's the sure mercies of David. So that's where we ended last week with that, that promise of the sure mercies of David, looking at all of the history of Israel. And as we looked at the history of Israel, you could see that scarlet thread of redemption woven through every bit of it. All of those historical accounts that had taken place where you see so vividly a type, symbol, sign of the Messiah, of Jesus, and the redemption that he would bring. Wasn't it wonderful? And, and, and listen, to, uh, particularly, particularly today when anti-Semitism is just swelling, and it's demonic. Make no mistake about it. The hatred of the Jews is demonic. And it's the Jews now which is going to be the body of Christ later. I'm not talking about Chris and dumb. They'll dance their way to hell. I, I hope you understand there's a difference between Christendom and the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the remnant that's within that organization called church. But then there's the organism called the body of Christ. It's very different. You understand that, don't you? Amen? Amen. Good, 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 good. And so, as you understand that, you realize that the anti-Semitism of today is simply Satan's continued attack against God and God's people. The Jews then and now, the church, the body of Christ, even now. And we're going to see it become more aggressive. Never before had I thought, being so blessed as to grow up in this country, that I would see our government turn against the church. But it is. And against Israel. So we need to pray. We need to pray for Israel. But we're looking at the history of Israel. We can see the gospel woven through every historical account. We see the types and the signs and the symbols of Jesus through every account. It's amazing. You can find Jesus in every single book in the Old Testament, all 39 of them. And now we come to the history of Jesus. As we're continuing this first sermon that Paul would preach. Where's Paul now? Can you drop that? Map for me, please. What are we studying? Paul's first missionary journey. That's what we're studying, Paul's first missionary journey. Yeah? You're going to catch up with me, right? I'm just trying to refresh you and put your thinking caps on, right? That's where we've been. Ah, here we are, okay? Paul started out, this is the new center of Christianity, right? Of the church, Antioch. It used to be formerly Jerusalem, but why is it no longer Jerusalem? Because they rejected their Messiah, and now the, the gospel has gone out to the Gentile where Paul would be an apostle unto the Gentiles. And this is what we're seeing, how the, the gospel is going to go forth, forth because of the Jewish rejection. Those foolish Jews rejecting their Messiah. How did that happen? Predetermined by God for the salvation of the Gentiles. God predetermined, read Romans 9, 10, 11, God predetermined the rejection of the Messiah by Israel for the salvation of you and I, for the Gentiles. Oh, but through all of that, what's he going to do? Bring the Jews to jealousy because of your love, your appreciation, your worship, your adoration of the Messiah of Israel? It'll cause Jews to come back home. Now, we saw that he went over to Salamis, the Isle of Cyprus, who, who was the resident that we know so well in Cyprus? Barnabas, that was his hometown, Barnabas. He went from Solomon's to Paphos, a 100-mile journey. Paphos, he went to Perga, Perga to Pamphylia. Pamphylia, he goes on to the city of Antioch. What happened in Perga, in Pamphylia? What was that area known for? 
Yeah, malaria, malaria. You could very easily contract malaria there, and Paul did. And so Paul had to leave that area, go to the mountainous region in Galatia. And Galatia is where the Gentiles were. And who got afraid and went home to Mama? John Mark. John Mark was afraid at that time. He didn't want to go into the area of Galatia. It's very dangerous in that area. Bandits, extortion. Uh, I'm not going. I'm going home. I miss Mama's cook, and I miss my bed. I miss my books. I miss my dog. I don't know. Whatever else. <laughs> so he left. But case in point, he went from Pisidia and Antioch. He went over to Iconium. He went to Lystra, the Derby. Now we're not there yet. We're still in Pisidia and Antioch. But what happened in Lystra? Paul was, was murdered. He was stoned. He was dead. Make no mistake about it. When Paul records in Corinth, as he's writing to the church at Corinth, that he rose up to the third heaven, that's when that happened. Wasn't it wonderful, all the description he gave us of heaven? How much of a description did Paul give you of heaven? What a tuzi pots. Oh, you're not Italian, are you? No. What a, what a crazy man. Why didn't he give us any description of heaven? It'd be criminal to try to describe it. Heaven is so wonderful, there are not words that are sufficient in the description of heaven. Do you understand? That's our blessed hope. Paul said it would be criminal. Literally, he says, it'd be criminal for me to try to explain to you what I've seen. Hmm. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at his first missionary journey, and now we're his first sermon being preached, because there, when he went to uh, that region of Asia, they asked, he, here, let's read the text. You can raise the map now. Thank you, Darren. Go with me to Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia in verse 13 to, uh, let's see, we, we covered verse 13 to about 25 last time we were together. Uh, what I want to point out to you right now is that the men in the synagogue that where Paul was attending during that time asked him if he had anything to share. In verse 15, it says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And that's when Paul began to preach his first sermon. How many sermons did Paul preach in the book of Acts? Eleven, thank you, eleven. So this is the first of eleven sermons. Now, Paul begins, he stands up and he begins to talk to the Jews about the history of Israel and how they should have known. There should have been no doubt in their mind because of the writings of the law and the prophets and the Psalms, all that was revealed with regard to the Messiah that Jesus had fulfilled. Yet, yet they were blinded by it. We wonder today how, how so many people could be so ignorant of the fact that the reality of Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world. There is no other, is there? No, 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 no. Be very careful, beloved, because there's a... Heresy is spread very insidiously. Satan is not called the serpent for no reason at all. The serpent is very cunning. And most of what he'll share will be true, but it'll be that portion of the truth that is denied that is so deadly. And what's being denied today is the exclusivity of Jesus Christ for salvation. We're going to get there. We've talked about the history of Israel. Now we're going to talk about the history of the Christ, the Messiah. And there is only but one way. Do you understand that? You need to be clear on that because 80% 80 80 of those people who claim to be born again, when asked the question, can good people of other faiths go to heaven, how do they answer? Yes. They're not saved. You, listen to me. Listen to me closely. You cannot believe that there are other ways legitimate to heaven except for Christ alone and still claim to have saving faith because saving faith is in Christ alone. Do you understand? And unfortunately today, is being very, very confused. A couple weeks ago, we ended with a song. Remember who sang that song, what that song was? I'm a nobody. Want to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. Who sang that song? Very disheartened to hear what's happening recently in a concert that they're giving, a concert to raise funds. You know who they're giving a concert for and who they're raising funds for? Who is it, Pat? Oh, you're just shaking your head. No, I was disagreeing because they were raising funds for Catholic priests. They're raising funds for Catholic priests. 
is there any harmony? Now listen, beloved, I, I'm sorry, but doctrine divides. And if you don't have sound, sound doctrine, you're going to be deceived. And there are many today who would rather have this celebrated music and a feel-good experience than the knowledge of sound doctrine. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you. It'll be fewer and fewer and fewer who embrace the truth, for they will embrace, as it is said in the last days, the love of the lie. And the lie is the denial of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ for salvation only. Casting crowns is doing a concert to help support priests in Catholicism. Is Catholicism Christianity? No. I grew up a Catholic. So how many of you were Catholic before you became saved? Yeah, look at, look at them. You, you can't embrace Catholic doctrine, Vatican I, Vatican II, and, and have salvation. You're denying the tr truth and the exclusivity of Christ. For I am, he said, the way and the truth and the life, and there is no other. Now, beloved, I, listen, I make no apologies about that. Because the Catholic Church themselves believe if you're outside of the church, you're damned. All of you are damned. Why? Because you can't participate in the sacraments that they believe they alone have the power to perform, which leads to a hope of salvation, but never the assurance. The Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, writes in his first Johannine epistle, I have written these things that you may know you have eternal life. Know you have eternal life. Now, listen to me. I, it breaks my heart. My family name. Variali, first generation, Variali, born again, evangelical. The rest of my family are still lost in a works system of salvation. Can you work your way to heaven? No, impossible, impossible. And they believe that only they have the power to transform the Eucharist, the wine, into his blood, the host, into his body. We call that the Eucharistic miracle? It's a lie, beloved. If the church had the opportunity today, they'd still be selling indulgences. A money-making proposition where, where before you commit the sin, you can come to the priest and for so many copper coins, your sins could be forgiven you ahead of time before you commit them. How abominable. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if I'm offending you, I'm sorry, because it's the truth. It's the truth that's offending you. It's not me. Seek the truth. And you'll be saved. Seek the truth and you'll be delivered. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying, and if this becomes foreign to you, then pray that God would open up your mind, open up the heart of your understanding. This, this wedding that's taking place. I'm really off my message this morning, aren't I? <laughs> this wedding that's taking place, this marriage between evangelicalism and Catholicism. Has it been prophesied? Where? Revelation. Where? One world religion. Okay. Okay. More specifically, you know, go with me to Revelation chapter 4. Chapter 3. You can tell that our services are not scripted. Nothing is predetermined here. And whose service is this? It's a Holy Spirit service. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, it seems you're taking me in a different direction this morning. And there has to be a reason. And so, Lord, may your will and your reasons be accomplished, Lord. And may you open the eyes of those who need to have their eyes open, their ears unstopped, Lord. Swell their heart and their mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Revelation for a minute. This is the message to the seven churches in verses in uh, chapters two and three. You see that? <clears throat> Chapter two describes the church of Ephesus, right? What was the problem with the church in Ephesus? It left its first love. It was, listen, it was a well-oiled machine. I mean, they were performing everything that they knew to do as far as church life, and, and, but all for the wrong motives. 
you know. And so, and listen, people in ministry, it's so easy to allow what first brought you into ministry, which is your love for Jesus and your love for his word, to cause that love to grow cold, and now you're just worried about keeping the machine alive. Shouldn't be. And that's, that was the church of Ephesus, and, and, and Christ warned them. Here, then, you had the church of Smyrna, and what was that? The persecuted church, the suffering church. This is the only, well, only two churches in these messages to the seven churches in Revelation does Jesus not have a commendation or condemnation for condemnation. Everyone, every other church is a condemnation. The only two churches he had a commendation for was who? Smyrna and Philadelphia. Philadelphia, okay? So Smyrna was a suffering church, right? And then from there, you had Pergamos. And what was Pergamos? The compromised church. And what did Pergamos represent? The imperial church, right? And then from there, the next church? Thyatira. Now, now, here we go. Now, what did Thyatira represent? Do you know? Do you remember? Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. And then you had Sardis. And what did Sardis represent? Dead Protestantism. Now, what's the last church and the last message that Jesus gives? Laodicea. And listen to me. Laodicea is a marriage of the two. Thyatira and Sardis. Dead evangelicalism and Catholicism coming together to form the Laodicean church. The last day's church. That Jesus said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I wish that you were hot or that you were cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. What does it mean, I wish you were hot, or, you, or at least that you were cold? If you're hot, you're therapeutic, right? You're, you're, you're using of God to bring healing to people in a therapeutic sense, right? Because they would talk about the hot springs in that area when they're giving that message. Oh, I wish that you were cold. What does it mean to be cold? Refreshing, invigorating. Ah, I needed that, right? And that's what he said. I wish that you were one or the other, but you're neither. There's no spiritual life in you whatsoever. Now, this marriage that's taking place, you've got to understand, what are, what are some of the forces that are at work right now that you're aware of that are bringing about this unholy alliance? Okay. 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 Yeah? Give me some examples. Also. So, so that you need to be informed. You need to be aware. I want your head out of the sand. Casting crowns is going in that direction. I can hear this huge sucking sound like a vacuum cleaner sucking all these people who are not embracing sound doctrine into this lie that the world would believe. One way is the, the series called The Chosen. You know, The Chosen is one of the most popular series that has ever been produced worldwide. So much of it is true. It's the little twist that brings the lie. How about Rick Warren? What's this organization that Rick Warren is heading up that, that, is, that is international, that even the, the Rome, the Catholic Church in Rome is, is advocating? FTT, what does it mean? Finish the task. Finish the FTT, finish the task. Bringing the two together. How about NAR? You familiar with NAR? What's NAR? New Apostolic Reformation. Now, some of you are familiar. Some of you are clueless. If you're clueless sitting here this morning, you need to become aware. Start to be very concerned about spiritual things because it's going to have the greatest impact on our life and the world. Right now, this anti-Semitism, what's taking place in the Middle East, what's taking place worldwide, the world's on fire. But most of it, believe me, beloved, is spiritual. So be warned and be careful. Don't take my word for it. Be good Bereans. What did Paul say about the Bereans in commending them? They searched the scriptures. I don't think Pastor Wright is right. Or writ. <laughs> I've had somebody tell me that. But I said, don't believe me. I'm not sharing with you what I believe. I'm sharing with you what the Bible teaches. And if you have a problem with it, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with God and his word. And that is the problem today. The massive 
ignorance with regard to the word among people who say they love God. But they don't know the word of the God. They don't know the word of God, and therefore they don't know the God of the word. That he has declared there's but one way. And that one way is not with works. That one way is not through sacraments. That one way is through Jesus alone. Now listen to me. Don't, don't be bad-mouthing the Catholics alone. Evangelicalism, we created one huge sacrament. And if you participate in this sacrament alone, you're guaranteed salvation. This works sacrament. What is it? Altar call. Altar call. The altar call is a new invention in the history of the church. You got to understand that. When Constantine established Christianity as the religion of the state in 312, they wouldn't baptize anybody for a year. They'd watch your life. Listen with your, listen with your eyes. That'll tell you who people are. People live what they believe. And when you listen with your eyes, it, may, it becomes very clear. Because your ears can deceive you, right? Hmm. I know what I believe. And I know what I believe is absolutely true. Why? Because I study the Word of God. And it's led me to the truth of the God of the Word. When I was a Catholic, my priest told me, don't read the Word of God. You don't have the intelligence. You don't have the ability to read and understand it. And I'd ask him all these questions about the New Testament, about the Old Testament. He seemed to know everything about church history. He didn't seem to know anything about the Bible. It's a denial of the truth, beloved. Now, in evangelicalism, we create one huge sacrament. We, we bring people to a false sense of spiritual security that if you've gone forward in the Billy Graham crusade, you're sealed, man. You're in. It's the Holy Grail. Is that true? No. Do you know that 97% of the people who go forward in the Billy Graham crusade, they're not real? How do I know that? Because the Billy Graham Evangelistic, and Evangelistic Association goes to great lengths to follow up with everybody who comes forward. And they'll follow up with the first met of as much as 24 months to see whether they're plugged into the church, are they being discipled, are they growing in the Word of God? And you know how many do? 3%. Three out of 100, beloved. That means 97% of those professions were simply an emotional response, not a volitional surrender of who they are. And God accepts nothing less than your surrender. Your absolute surrender is what the king requires in order for you to become a citizen of the kingdom. He died for you, now you live for him. Or are you asking him to live for you? That's the difference between real believers and make-believers today. Make-believers have their agenda, and they want Christ to live for them. Believers have no agenda, and we live for him. You understand that? Good. Acts chapter 13. I don't know why we went there, but there's a reason. God must know, right? I'm thankful it's his church, not mine. His service, not mine. Anyway, we were talking about last week how we went through Paul's first sermon. Paul's first sermon, he went through all of the history of Israel and how the Jews should have clearly seen that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promises that God made throughout all of the Old Testament. And then the sure mercies of David, when he promised that it would be the son of David who would sit upon the throne forever and ever and ever, that the son of David would be the Messiah, right? And we'll pick it up... Uh, Let's pick it up in verse 23, speaking of David. Well, let's go to 22. Let's go to 20. <laughs> Chapter tw 13, verse 20. After that, he gave them judges in about 450 years until Samuel the prophet, and after they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years, and then he had removed him, he raised up for them, David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do my will. Wait a minute. I know David. I know what David's done. David's, there are times in David's life he is a dirty, rotten scoundrel. You can't believe this man's even saved by some of the things he did. Is that true? Are you saved by your performance? You're saved by his. You're not saved by your performance. You're saved by his. But you're saved by faith. The grace gift from God is faith to believe, right? For the just shall live by faith, faith in God's word and with faith in what God has done. And so David was not measured on his performance because he never could be, nor could you or I. If God's going to judge me on my performance, I'm done. I'm finished. And so are you, right? 
But it says, after my own heart. What did David, what did David not do? Oh, Saul. Saul wanted power, right? And Solomon, Solomon, the son of David, he wanted treasures and riches, right? What did David want? Just fellowship with God. If David could have been anything else, he would have prayed to be a priest, a son of Levi, so he could be worshiping God and leading the people in the worship of God. But, but he did in so many of his psalms and so many of his life examples. Well, one thing David never, ever, ever did was worship false gods. No idols in David's life. God was always first. God was always true. Well, yeah, his performance? Are there times when you've said or done things and you wonder whether you're even saved? Have you? Yeah. Of course we have. But it's not our performance, it's his. Praise God for that, right? David, a man who minds own heart, he will do my will. And from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now we're going to talk about the history of Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all of the people of Israel. Verse 25 now, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not he. But behold, there comes one after me whose sandals, whose sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, the Jews, and those who are among you who fear God, the Gentiles, to you the word of his salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, even, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled in them them in condemning him. They fulfilled the voice of the prophets and what the prophets had, so, had said in condemning Jesus. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. He was murdered, he was buried, but he rose again, right? Now, would... Paul is addressing to the Jews specifically. He's in the synagogue. You should know these things. John, John the Baptist, of those born of women, none greater. And all of them believe that John was a prophet sent by God. When John sees Jesus coming to him while he's baptizing there at the Jordan, what does he say? Behold, the Pesach in the Hebrew, the Peshka in the Greek text. Behold the Passover. Now, the Gentiles on the shore that day wouldn't have understood at all what he was saying, but every Jew should have known what he is declaring is that Jesus would be the one who would die, the Lamb of God who dies for the sins of the world. Jesus is that Peshka in the Hebrew, the Pesach, uh, excuse, Peshka in the, in the Greek text, Pesach in the Hebrew text, and that word means either the festival of Passover or the Sacrifice the lamb that would be sacrificed on Passover. So what was John referring to, Jesus, as a festival or as the lamb of God? And that's what he said. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You wouldn't believe the prophets. You wouldn't believe the history of Israel. You wouldn't believe all that was declared in type, sign, and symbol of the Messiah. You wouldn't even believe the festivals and the feast days of Israel. What did the Passover represent? The first Passover. The first Passover and that lamb that was sacrificed that night on the 14th day of Nisan was sacrificed as a type, a sign, a symbol of the ultimate sacrifice that would be made in Jesus. Jesus literally, now you go back and study this. Do not take my word for any of this. Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover. Do you think that was coincidental? No. John through Paul, John declared he would be the Passover, and now Paul is reminding him of all that had taken place. Jesus was the fulfillment of all that the Passover represented for most two, over 2,000 years. And not only that, what's the very next feast after Passover? Unleavened bread. The feast of unleavened bread. What's leaven? What is, what is it, what does leaven do? You make a bread, right? You like to make a bread? Make it a bread. You got to put the leaven in the bread. You got to knead the dough. I love fresh bread. Don't you? Love? Oh, man, I love fresh bread in the morning. Smell that smell throughout the kitchen. Oh, give me a cup of coffee and a pound of butter. And oh, man. Manja fat the gross, huh? Leaven. 
But you've got to have leaven, right? To let, what does leaven do? Leaven, listen to me, leaven expediates the rotting process of the dough. You understand that? It helps the dough rot quicker. And it rots by what? Puffing up, right? And what puffs up? Pride, sin. Hmm. So leaven is always representative of sin. What does sin do? It rots. It speedy. The more sin, the more rot. Or it expediates the rotten process. But the feast of unleavened bread is that all leaven would be removed. When was that celebrated? Excuse me. That was celebrated on the 15th day of the Jewish month, Nazan. Was that fulfilled in the time of Christ's crucifixion? Yes. He died on Passover. And that death that he died once and for all. How many times did he die? Once! <laughs> Not over and over and over as I was lied to. No. Once for sin. And the Bible is clear on that. Repeatedly. Once. He died for the sins of all. The feast of unleavened bread was fulfilled on the very day. <sighs> what a coincidence. The next feast that the Jews should... Listen, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. They know all these things. The very next feast, first fruits. And what happened on the feast of first fruits in the year in which Jesus was crucified? He rose from the dead. And Paul records that. He is the first fruits among many brethren. Hallelujah is right. Jesus literally fulfilled the first three feasts on the very day. Please don't believe me. Search it out. Search the truth. The truth will set you free. What's the very next feast? Pentecost. The Jews don't call it Pentecost. What do they call it? Feast of Revelation. Why? It's commemorating the giving of the law. Right? When Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, whoa, what a glorious day that was. Not for Israel, though, what? He came down from the mountain with his faithful assistant, Yeshua. And what happened? And on the day they received the law, how many died that day? 3,000. With the reception of the law, 3,000 died. Can the law save you? No, because it's not your performance. It says you could never perform. You could never win approval before God by your good works. Oh, but on Pentecost, Feast of Revelation, not the law, but the Spirit was given. And on Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, it records for us how many were saved that day. Well, isn't that amazing? With the giving of the law, 3,000 died, for the law brings forth death. Makes us aware of what sinners we are. But with the reception of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaGodesh, Ruach HaGodesh, my mind is going faster than my mouth. The Ruach HaGodesh, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Holiness, the Numa of God, Numa Hagiosuni in the New Testament, comes in to dwell within us, then you are made holy, you are acceptable before God, not because of you, because now God looks down, and he doesn't look down upon you and see your sin, he looks down in you, sweet Gail, and what does he see? Jesus. He sees Jesus in you now. That's how salvation occurs. Yes. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. All fulfilled in the life of Christ. All fulfilled at his death, burial, and ascension. Resurrection and ascension. Don't you think the Jews should have known that? Don't you think? Listen, it wouldn't take much, even if you had a pencil and an eraser, okay, to figure out how the dots are connected. You might have to erase a couple lines, but you could, you could it, it should have been no mental feat whatsoever to connect all the dots and say, <sighs> And so many, so many of the Jews did, but the majority did not. And this, this is so disheartening as we read it, and we wonder why. Why? Because blindness has happened in part, and the only way the eye can see, the only way the ears can hear, the only way the mind can comprehend, the only way the heart can love is if he puts it in us. It's not of you, beloved. It's all of him. That's how glorious grace is. Sovereign grace. So let's read on. This is what Paul was explaining to them. And he says in verse 26, Men and brethren and sons of the family of Abraham and those who are among you who fear God, Jews, Gentiles, 
No, that the word of the salvation has been sent for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him, nor even the voice of the prophets which are read every Sabbath have fulfilled in them a condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses to the people. And we declare you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children. In that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. What did he say in the second psalm? You are my, today I have the exaltation of the Christ, the anointing of the Son of God. Go with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is going to be literally fulfilled very soon. Has God given us a spirit of fear? Love, power, and a sound mind. Now listen, that's what's important. You're thinking. Not your feeling, but your thinking. Okay? So often, too, too, too often, too many people who call themselves led by their feelings. It, what, whatever feels right. No, no, no. Whatever is truly right. You're thinking, right? Now, we, we, we're, it appears. Now, I'm not a prophet, but it appears the world is headed for a very, very difficult time. Did you read that blogger this morning? You know that blogger? <laughs> he said something about the DNC and where that's leading us. Where's it leading us? Totalitarianism. Make no mistake about it. There's no free speech. The president is not free to speak as he wills. The candidate for presidency is not free to speak as she would like. They're all controlled. There's no free speech in America anymore. Why? Because the elitists, those behind them, the, the puppet masters, want to control everything. We're headed toward a totalitarianism form of worldwide government. There's going to be a one-world religious system, a one-world economic system, a, a one-world uh, governmental system, a one-world health care system, World Health Organization. Everybody? It's just having a difficult time getting the Chinese and the Russians to cooperate. <laughs> but Europe is. England is, the United States is, the NC is, the one lone voice standing against all of that for you and I. Donald Trump. Amazing. Got to pray for his soul. Hmm? Pray for him and his safety, right? But here, Psalm 2, what, what we're going to be seeing very soon is the fulfillment of this psalm. Psalm 2. Do you have a heading in your Bible for Psalm 2? Okay, one at a time, please. The reign of the Lord's anointed. Anybody else? The Messiah's triumph. So this is what, go ahead. The coronation of the king. Yes, yes, yes. All, that's what all of this is about. Now, Jesus has won the victory, right? But he hasn't yet taken possession of that which is his and sitting upon his rightful throne when he returns to earth and establishes 1,000-year millennial reign. That's coming, beloved. Hallelujah. I pray it comes very soon. You know? What's up, folks? Jesus coming down for me. What about you? That's what you got to tell people, right? Jesus is coming down in a heart near you. <laughs> Amen? Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage tumultuous and the people plot a vain thing? Have you seen what's going on in England, in London? Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The lawlessness. And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Jehovah, the Lord, against his anointed Christ, saying, let us break their bonds and pieces, cast away their cords from us. It's a, it's a lead rope, cords. It's, it's the word of God, the word of God is meant to lead you, right? It's a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet, right? It leads you into all truth, it leads you into righteousness, it leads you into peace, it leads you into the right relationships, and they hate it all, and they want to cut off any right of moral excellence that the Bible supports. Look at the degradation. Look at the Olympics opening ceremony that all these world leaders had applauded with debauchery. How profane. What a rejection of the one true God and his will. 
his ways, his word. That's what we're talking about here. This is exactly what's happening today. Isn't this amazing? Don't you find that amazing here in the United States of America? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> he sh the Lord shall hold them in derision. Yeah, I opened up the garage door just the other morning, and what did I see? El palmetto bug. That's a nice way of saying cockroach, right? That cockroach looked up at me, I looked down at him, and he went like this. Oh, really? <laughs> really? That's this text. God, God looks down at the world and the world's hatred of him and animosity of him and war towards him, and he laughs. He laughs. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. This is his burning anger. Now, listen, God is love. And God is grace. You have an expiration date on everything you have at home? I told Gail, even I have an expiration date. I just don't know what it is yet. Right? Expires on, you know, of no use then. Well, good. Take me home. Right? God's, listen to me, God's grace and mercy, God's long-suffering, His patience. There's an expiration date. That's what we're talking about here. Today is the choice. Today you have an opportunity, you can be the object of His perfect love. Or you can be the object of His perfect wrath. Because this wrath that is being described here, His deep displeasure, it is perfect. He is absolutely just, righteous, holy in exercising his wrath upon a world that has rejected him and his son and his spirit. What is the unpardonable sin? Rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Christ, with regard to salvation. That's, that's the only unpardonable sin. What makes the difference between a person who is the object of his wrath as opposed to a person who is the object of his love? Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, being born again. Born again, you're the object of his perfect love. As I said, he looks down upon you and he sees Jesus in you. If you're not in Jesus, he looks down upon you, he sees your sin. And sin cannot exist where the Lord is, in his presence. Do you understand? That's clearly the difference. Everybody, every human being you'll ever meet, you're either saved or you ain't. Saints or ain'ts. You understand? It's the only two choices. You're the object of his perfect love in Christ, the object of his perfect wrath because you're rejecting Christ. And the world very soon, very soon is going to realize we were right. The word of God is true. The heretics that are among us, multitudinous, a plurality of heretics. The largest church in Georgia, a heretic. What's his name? Andy Stanley. A heretic. Why? Because they no longer believe that the Bible is inspired, that 40 authors wrote over 1,500 years, 66 books, that are all written not by the human author, but by the Holy Spirit of God, who inspired them to write what they wrote. The inspiration of Scripture. It's not only inspired, it is infallible. What does that mean? It's accurate in everything it teaches. Everything it has to share, no matter what it is. Now, you flat earthers, I'm sorry. Isn't, isn't it unbelievable that there are people today who believe that the earth is flat? Now, now, I can understand before we had big looking glasses, before we could take these metal monsters and fly them in the sky and see that the earth is a sphere, all of the world thought the world was flat. But the Bible said God sits upon the sphere of the earth. The Bible said it's round. There are so many times in which science, science, has contradicted the Bible, but eventually, given enough time, the Bible has proven to be true. But today, in our humanistic culture, God is no longer the God of the Bible. Science is their God. And science has been proven wrong over and over and over again, time and time again. I'm thankful for science. I'm thankful for, for truly observable science that can help improve our life. But the Bible's true. The Word of God is infallible, accurate in everything it intends to do. It's inspired, it's infallible, therefore it is, it, no, it's also inerrant. What does that mean? 
There's no mistakes. Now, that's in the original manuscripts. The Aramaic and the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, there's no mistakes. There's no errors. Inspired, infallible, inerrant, and therefore, what is it? Do really people demonstrate that it's authoritative? No. No. Listen to me now, beloved. And if you're one of them, you need to change. If you're one of them, you need to make an adjustment this morning. There are a lot of people who claim his name, claim to be a Christian, claim to believe the Bible, but they don't live under its authority. You have to live under the authority of the Scripture. You don't have an option. These, it's commanded. It's mandated. It's not suggested. Yet, verse 6, I have set my king, Jesus, on my holy hill of Zion. Yeah, the cornerstone that was rejected, right? The Lamb of God. And I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What does that mean he was begotten? That he was, he was born? No. The Bekor, the Prototokos, the preeminent one, first, right? That's what it means here. The begotten of the Father. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a powder's vessel. There's a day of judgment and destruction coming, beloved. The Bible is clear on that. But so many people are denying that today, putting their head in the sand. Don't want to believe that. Every one of us one day will stand before God and have to give an account of our stewardship. What have you done with the life that I've given you? Now that you have placed the life of my son in your life, what have you done with that? Hmm. There, now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, O you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. This is the servant of a bondservant, a doulos. As Paul would call himself the doulos of God. And with fear, moral reverence, and rejoice with trembling, kiss the son. The word worship, proskonos, what does it mean? In the Greek text, what does it mean to kiss? To worship? It means to kiss. <laughs> worship, proskonos, means to turn towards and to kiss. When we worship God, we're just explaining how much we love him, adore him, desire him. Hmm. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Mm. Back to the text. He quotes from Psalm 2. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus. The suffering of the Messiah is clear in Psalm 22. It's clear from Isaiah 53. It's clear from so many passages in the scriptures that the Messiah would suffer first. Then he would reign. But so many of the Jews, they deny the suffering Messiah, but all oh, they like the reigning triumphant Messiah. But both are described in the scriptures. He came the first time to suffer. He came the first time as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He's coming the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Then he's going to reign triumphantly. Then he's going to destroy his enemies. Verse 34, and that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption. And he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now, what were they? I told you that at the beginning. What are the sure mercies of David? All the promises that God made for you and I, for the Jew and Gentile who would believe in the son of David who would come, believe in the Davidic covenant, and that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. All of those promises, all that mercy is ours. Mercy through the son of David. What did they cry out when he came into Jerusalem, made his triumphal entry? Hosea, Hosea, save now, save now. Have mercy on us, O son of David. Have mercy on us. That's the sure mercies of David. That's what he's talking about here. Hmm? Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to see corruption. Where's that? Psalm 16. Turn there. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Let's pick it up in verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. 
My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. You got hope? Oh, we have a blessed hope. We have a living hope, beloved. Listen, we all know that something, they hang around here long enough, right? You're going to experience corruption in this body. This body will see corruption. The moment you're born, you're dying. Okay? It's just a process that's taking place. Maybe a little bit different time-wise for everybody, right? But the moment we're born, we're dying. We're corrupting. Oh, but one day we'll see no corruption. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Hmm? Hmm. As he's talking about here in the night seasons. Yes, I have hope in you, Lord, a living hope. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Mm, that's why when we recite the creed, if you don't know anything about the Apostles' Creed, in its earliest form, it was recited in the 300s. It was a concise doctrinal statement of which you must believe in order to be saved, because not everybody had a manuscript. It was very expensive to afford any of the manuscripts of the Old Testament or the Psalms, right? And, and the New Testament at that point uh, wasn't written so clearly, so available to so many people. So they would recite these creeds, and the Apostles' Creed was one of them in its earliest form, the 300s, to prove beyond a doubt this is what you must believe in order to be saved, that Jesus descended into Hades. Hades is the Greek equivalent to the Old Testament Sheol, the Hebrew Sheol. Sheol and Hades are one and the same. Now that's not the permanent place of torment. It's not Gehana. Okay? Sheol Hades, the basic definition is mankind's common grave. In the Old Testament, everybody who died, no matter who you were, righteous dead, unrighteous dead, everybody who died went to Sheol. In Sheol, Jesus records for us an historical account of the fact that there are two realms within Sheol. There's the realm of the righteous dead, there's the realm of the unrighteous dead. Right? And, and, the, and the two cannot mingle with one another. Jesus talked about a historical account where there was a rich man who died and the beggar Lazarus also died. The rich man went to that place reserved for the ungodly. Lazarus went to the place reserved for the godly. It's what we call Abraham's bosom because of that historical account. Jesus said Lazarus was being comforted in the arms of Father Abraham. Jesus refers to it as Paradise, because he said to the thief on the cross who confessed faith in him, he said, my son, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now that's not heaven. Why can that not be heaven? Because he hadn't gone to heaven yet. Jesus has to be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus had to make entrance first on our behalf. Okay? So when he talked about paradise or Abraham's bosom, he's talking about that place of Hades or Sheol where for the righteous dead. Now the unrighteous dead, that was the place where the rich man went. And the rich man could see Father Abraham. And he could see Lazarus. And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to drop a drop of water on my tongue. Can you imagine being so thirsty that that would satisfy you? You know, it gets hot back there. We work. I mean, July and August are hard to take here, aren't they? I love it here except for July and August. This, this, this fat boy starts to melt. You know? But I can't believe that that, that that would satisfy my thirst. I don't think so. I don't know how much water and Gatorade I've drank back there. Right, fellas? But here, this place of torment, this man believed that just a drop of water would help satisfy him. That's extreme torment. Anything you, you and I couldn't even conceive of the torment he was going through. And Abraham said to this man, son, even if I will, he can't. There's a separation between where you are and where we are, and the two can never meet again. You had your chance, and now it's over. It's over. Father Abraham, I have seven brothers. Send this man back to warn my brothers in this place. And Abraham said, don't you know? Even if one would come back from the dead, they won't believe. That's what he said, didn't he? Is God not merciful? Is God not gracious? 
After that, what did Jesus do? What did God do? He raised Lazarus. Not the beggar, but the other Lazarus. And did they believe? No. 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 And then Jesus himself was raised from the dead. Did they believe? No. No. Even if one would come back from the dead. Now, you don't believe because of miracles. You don't believe because of supernatural phenomenon. You believe by faith. God gives you a grace gift of faith to believe. All that the Bible says with regard to the Messiah. And this is what Paul is trying to emphasize with the Jews. Oh, my. It's quarter to 12. Ah, we don't need lunch. Go well, fast. We are feeding on the word of God this morning. Therefore, he also, in another psalm, says, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, it's not only prophesied there in Psalm 16. Peter's first sermon in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, he recites the same thing. That's why we say in the creed that he descended into Hades. That's where he went, Hades. But the place of the righteous dead, the place of paradise, the place of Abraham's bosom. And he's going to rise from there next week. <laughs> he's going to raise from the dead. Shall we stand? Oh, beloved. Know the word of God. The word of God will set you free. And the word of God will keep you safe. Aren't you, aren't you so happy for God's saving grace? Aren't you? Now, the, listen to me now. Listen to me carefully. Now, now you, I'm so blessed by God's saving grace in my life. But let me tell you something. The more I'm in the word of God, the more I'm blessed by his keeping grace. He keeps me by his spirit, but he keeps me through the word. The spirit is the author of the word. And through the word of God coming into my mind and it penetrating into my heart, I am kept for that day. And so are you, beloved. Stay true to the word. Be careful. Remain in sound doctrine. Amen? Mm -hmm.